Well, good morning, Walden Church. It's so good to see all of you both here in the sanctuary and those of you who are watching on YouTube and Facebook. Welcome to everyone. Thank you for coming together. We are in the middle of a sermon series. Well, actually, we're coming towards the end, right? This is coming towards the end of the seven woes of the Pharisees. And we've arrived now today at woe number six, which means we have one more woe to go. One more woe to go. Jesus is out to lunch with the Pharisees. They uh, invited him over for a meal. They probably wanted to pick his brain, ask him some questions, examine him. But Jesus instead is going to use this time, use this platform as a way of telling them all the things he doesn't like about them. It's kind of like Jesus picked up a chicken wing and the Pharisees all said, hey, you got to be careful because uh, all those pieces have bones. And Jesus said, you know, speaking of bones, I have a bone to pick with you. Jesus says, Matthew 23, verse 15, woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. And this is, uh, this is not how to win friends and influence people. <laughs> You hypocrites, you travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and then you make that convert twice as much a child of hell as you are. What a statement. What a claim. What an accusation. Can you imagine? He calls his hosts, his meal hosts, his lunch hosts, a child of hell. And then he says, what's worse is, you reproduce. You guys actually make more of you. Jesus says, you lack grace, you distort scripture, and what you're doing is destructive, and then you make more of you. you are, you're a child of hell, but then your converts are twice a child of hell. You make converts, and they end up being just like you. Can you please stop? <laughs> you make spawn. You make destructive carbon copies, Jesus says. These are harsh words. They really are. You know, all this time, Jesus has been pointing out their flaws. But then he goes on and says, you know, it's, just, it's not just bad the way you are, but then you go and make more of you. Remember, these people that Jesus has been finding fault with, they're the teachers. They're the holy ones. They're the respected ones. They are the representatives of their faith. And in the public eye, they are the people who are right. They're doing it right, worshiping right, acting right, saying the right things. And basically, Jesus says, can you guys just stop teaching, please? Can you stop preaching? Can you stop evangelizing? Because what you're doing is you're just making more people like you. You're all contaminated. You're all sick. You're all diseased. And what you do is you go out into the world and you just spread your germs everywhere and you make other people contaminated look just like you. So going along with that thought that, that Jesus is saying, if they are the faith teachers, and they are the priests, right? And Jesus says, what you're doing is wrong. Then shouldn't we ask, well, how did Jesus do it? You know, if Jesus is criticizing them for doing it wrong, how did Jesus talk about faith? How did Jesus evangelize? Because he's, he's telling them about uh, being, being an evangelist, right? He says, you travel over land and sea to win a single convert. Okay, how did Jesus evangelize? How did Jesus share God's kingdom? So let's compare how Jesus made converts because he must have done it right. Jesus starts this conversation by saying, look at the Pharisees, but don't copy them because they don't practice what they preach. So, how does Jesus do it? And I know, I've heard it before. We say, you know, my friends, they don't really want to hear about Jesus. My brother-in-law thinks he knows everything. And, you know, he doesn't want to talk to us about God. I can't share my faith at work. I can't share my faith at school. But, you know, 
Faith isn't as tough a subject as we think. And the world isn't as closed to talking about faith as we think. When asked how important uh, people would say religion was in their own life, either very important, fairly important, or not very important, you know 49% of people said very important? 49%. Everyone has faith in something. Everyone has a worldview. So how do you talk about it? How do you share your faith? If someone asked you today, hey, so you're a Christian? Why? Why are you a Christian? You know, there used to be a song that we used to sing in church when I was a kid. It was called Pass It On. And the song begins, it only takes a spark to get a fire going. So how do we do it? How do you pass it on? And more importantly, how did Jesus do it? So let's look. Let's look at a couple of ways Jesus explains faith. What does Jesus do? Let's learn from our rabbi. Matthew 7 is part of Jesus' greatest sermon. It's a sermon on the mount. So this doesn't come as part of an interaction that he has with somebody else. Nobody asks a question. This is just one of Jesus' teaching points. These are one of the things that Jesus has on his heart. Jesus says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And those who seek, find. And to those who knock, the door will be opened. What a fascinating way to talk about faith. Jesus says it's like a door. How, what, what, what's faith like, Jesus? It's like a door. Well, tell me why uh, you're a Christian. Could you explain your faith to me? You know, it's kind of a bit like, like knocking on a door. You know, why do you follow Jesus? All because I'm a person that likes to ask questions, and my rabbi said that uh, faith is a lot like asking, and those who ask find answers. Well, why do you follow Jesus? I'm a seeker. My rabbi said that faith was about seeking and finding answers. If someone says, tell me why you're a Christian, a biblical answer would be, ask, seek, knock. Are those the metaphors that we typically use when we talk about our faith? Because all those metaphors are action verbs. When we experience faith, don't we knock? Don't we wait for answers? Wouldn't you say patience and sometimes even silence are part of our faith? My, my faith is like standing at a really big door. And you know, it takes a lot of patience sometimes. Sometimes I feel like I'm standing there knocking a lot. And when I pray, I, I can almost see God listening on the other side. And I'm waiting, waiting to go through that door, waiting for God's timing, waiting for the right moment. Your friend could say, wow, it, don't you feel like that's frustrating? And you could be honest. And you could say, yes, it is. But my faith is also about learning patience and about seeking the right door to knock on and praying about my patience and then waiting some more. Some doors open right away when I knock. Others are open for me even before I get there. And when that happens, it's amazing. Look, we don't need to paint a picture of our faith as being perfect or that it's worry-free because if we're going to be honest, even Jesus says that it's like knocking and seeking and asking. It's not a suffering-free life. Perhaps in our evangelism, as we try to share the gospel, we can be more honest, just like Jesus is, about what faith is really like. And this is not new. I mean, just look at the book of Psalms. Psalm 77 says, I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands and I would not be comforted. I remembered you, God, and I groaned. I meditated 
and my spirit grew faint. Psalm 74, O God, why have you rejected us forever? Why does your anger smolder against the sheep of your pasture? This is real, honest, vulnerable language. These are God's followers. And what do we see them doing? Asking, seeking, knocking. Isn't there some vulnerability in being a Christian? Isn't there sometimes quietness, moments of stillness, moments of waiting? In fact, half of the Psalms are, are laments. That there are cries out, their despair, their anger, their confusion, there's groanings. Here's another one, Psalm 59. Deliver me from my enemies, O God. Be my fortress against those who are attacking me. Deliver me from evildoers and save me from those who are after my blood. See how they lie and wait for me. Powerful people conspire against me for no offense or sin of mine. Lord, I have done no wrong, yet they are ready to attack me. Arise to help me. Look on my plight. The psalmist says, where are you, God? Right? His ask is, where are you? Can't you see that I'm surrounded? My enemies are everywhere. I feel alone. Please look at me. Please open this door and rescue me. What if someone were to ask you, hey, what's it like to be a Christian? And to say, you know, it's a bit like knocking. It's like waiting. Let's look at another one. Jesus is hanging out by himself at a well. His disciples have all gone to the grocery store to buy food. John 4 says, when a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and this well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and flocks and herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. Here's our second metaphor. Jesus talks about water. He gets into a conversation with a woman and he begins talking to her about faith and about worship. And Jesus doesn't use the same tried and true method every single time. He has no three point sermon, no Roman road, no five points. No, he uses the scenery and what's around him. He talks about water. He talks about her life. He talks about her marriage. Jesus, what is being a Christian like? He says, it's a bit like being thirsty for water and getting it. And then when you get it, never being thirsty again. Of all the images that Jesus could have used with the woman at the well, Jesus says, it's like being satisfied. What's it like to be a Christian? It's like satisfaction. You know that feeling you get when you go on a long trip and you're thinking about getting home and grabbing a glass from the cupboard and going over to the fridge and drinking a nice tall glass of ice water? You know that deep, replenishing feeling that you get from drinking water? You know how water satisfies you? how it quenches your thirst, Jesus says, what I have to give you satisfies like that. It's water that fills the depth of your being. Psalm 62 says, truly, my soul finds rest in God. My salvation comes from him. Isn't that satisfying? Now, you go and ask someone, 
Okay, go ask anyone. If they have an idea about Christians or who Christians are or what Christians believe, and they'll give you some sort of an idea, right? They'll have some sort of an opinion. Sure they do. Of course they do. Everyone does. Because whether we share our faith or, or it's we that are out there evangelizing, doesn't matter because others of us are out there sharing. There are, there are people out there and they are sharing the Jesus movement and the Jesus message with the world. But just like the Pharisees, we, we are evangelizing, we are proselytizing, we are out there making copies of ourselves. But what copy are we making? If you've ever made a bad copy in a copy machine, it's typically because your original is flawed. And this is Jesus' criticism. The woman at the well, she had an opinion. She had an opinion about the Jews and how her people were treated by the Jews. And it had left a bad taste in her mouth. She was an outcast. She was untouchable. She wasn't allowed in the same synagogues. You see, because back then, people probably evangelized the same way they do today. We either evangelize by conquest, which is a way of saying, I am right and you are wrong. Or we evangelize by persuasion, where you prove to them the rightness of your worldview. You prove to them the wrongness of their worldview. I need to persuade you. I need to win you. I need to make you believe. Or one could even be making that point right now, right? During COVID. During COVID, there are two schools of thought, two levels of safety, two camps. And the war is raging between those two sides. And we all yell at each other. I am right, and you are wrong. What about our ideas how we should run the country? Conquest and persuasion. I can prove that I am right, and you are wrong. What about what we believe in education, medicine, entertainment? Pick any subject, and the common approach is, let me stand on my soapbox, let me grab a bullhorn, let me stand behind this sandwich board, and let me shout it from the rooftops. I am the voice of reason, and all y'all are crazy, right? All of you are overreacting. I'm surrounded by idiots. I am right, and you are wrong. Conquest and let me persuade you to tell you why you are wrong. It's how we argue. This is how we fight. And it's how we were taught to fight. But here's the thing. We don't see Jesus use those techniques. We don't see Jesus share faith that way. The Samaritan woman, her story is typical of her day. And Jesus, like he always does, talks to her using the imagery and sights and things around him. And he says, you know what? You don't seem satisfied. You don't seem satisfied in life. You don't seem satisfied with your husband's. I want to tell you what satisfies. Look at this water. You know how it is when you're really thirsty and you drink something and it just satisfies you and fills you? He uses the words and the world that's right in front of her. They're at a well. And Jesus knows that life is not satisfying for her. And he says, my way this faith in God, it will quench your soul. 
much like how water satisfies your thirst. This is how Jesus chooses to communicate. He uses words like asking, seeking, knocking, thirst. Here's another one. Jesus is talking to a Pharisee, one of these men who make the converts of hell. John chapter 3, now there was a Pharisee, a man named Nicodemus, who was a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the signs you are doing if God were not with him. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. How can someone be born when they are old? Nicodemus asked. Surely they cannot enter a second time into their mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. Flesh give birth to flesh, and the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, You must be born again. Now watch this metaphor. Jesus says, The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell from where it's coming from or where it's going. And so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. So Jesus is approached by this teacher. We really don't even know why. I mean, Nicodemus doesn't even have a question, right? So we don't know why he's there. But here is Jesus making a picture again. What is God like? What is faith like? Well, it's kind of like, you know, you used to be one way, and then you go through this new birth, this new awakening, and now you see things differently. You used to be one way, and now you're different. Jesus begins teaching him about the kingdom of God, and he says, you know what? It's a lot like birth. It's actually a lot like wind like wind. Jesus says our faith is like a door. It's like thirst. It's like wind. Why do some people experience faith differently than others? Have you ever noticed that? Why do some people experience a profound transformation? And some people swear they hear the voice of God. Some people receive just massive blessing and others don't. Well, it's a lot like wind. Why do some marriages fall apart? Why did I lose my job? You know, I served, I gave my tithe, and it didn't all work out. How come? The math didn't add up. I didn't get those guarantees that I was promised, and now I don't want anything to do with the Bible. I don't want anything to do with church. I don't want anything to do with prayer. What happened? How come this person got sick? How come this person died? Isn't faith a guarantee? Jesus says, well, it's a lot like wind. Look, I would love for there to be guarantees, but there aren't that many. We have guarantees about who Jesus is, what he does for us, what God is like. 1 Corinthians 12 says, no one can say Jesus is Lord except the Holy Spirit. There just isn't a hard and fast rule that works every time. The steps don't always equal a perfect life. I don't care what that recent three-point sermon said. I don't know why some people experience what they do. I don't know why some pastors change the world or write books or start churches and others don't. I don't know why some good Christians lose their children, lose their jobs, lose their spouses. Maybe instead of trying to convince people that we are right and they are wrong or that we have answers, maybe we can just admit sometimes that it's like wind. Author Fulton Sheen said, criticism of others is thus an oblique form of self-commendation. 
We think we make the picture hang straight on our wall by telling our neighbors that all his pictures are crooked. Maybe we should just be honest and be clear and say, you know, sometimes life is confusing. Sometimes there are no answers. Sometimes life is painful. We do a great disservice when we say, come to Jesus and everything will be great. Because Jesus never says that. Jesus says it's like asking, like seeking, like knocking. He says it's like being thirsty. He says it's like wind that blows wherever it pleases. If someone sees you reading the Bible and they say, hey, what are you reading? I guess you could say, I'm studying wind. That'll pique their curiosity, right? What do you mean you're studying wind? Well, you know, how life is unpredictable. Life changes from day to day. Yeah. Well, my teacher says that God is a little bit like wind. Let's look at another one. Jesus is going to enter the Gerasenes. It's uh, a word that means the ten cities. It's not a Jewish area. So again, another story where Jesus is talking to non-believers or people not like him. We're looking at how Jesus communicates, how he speaks the gospel, how he shares faith, how he instructs, how he teaches. Luke 8 they sailed to the region of the Gerasenes, which is across the Lake of Galilee. When Jesus stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. For a long time, this man had not worn clothes or lived in a house, but had lived in the tombs. Hey, welcome to town. When he saw Jesus, he cried and fell at his feet, shouting at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. For Jesus had commanded the evil spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had seized him, and though he was chained hand and foot and kept under guard, he had broken his chains and had been driven by the demon into a solitary place. Jesus asked him, What is your name? Legion, he replied, because many demons had gone into him, and they begged Jesus repeatedly not to order them to go into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and the demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs, and he gave them permission. When the demons came out of the man, they went into the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. So there goes the local food supply. When those tending the pigs saw what had happened, they ran off and reported this in the town and countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they found the man from whom the demons had gone out, sitting at Jesus' feet, dressed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people how the demon-possessed man had been cured. Then all the people of the region of the Gerasenes asked Jesus to leave them because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat and left. The man from whom the demons had gone out begged to go with him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return home and tell how much God has done for you. So the man went away and told all over town how much Jesus had done for him. What a fantastic story. Jesus shows up to a town, right? Non-Jewish town. And the welcoming committee is a naked possessed man. Welcome to town. Jesus drives the demons that are in him into a herd of pigs. And then the townspeople get mad because Jesus has just now destroyed their food supply. And they rush Jesus out of town. And Jesus says, all right, all right, all right, I'll leave. And the demon-possessed man wants to go with Jesus. Right? New, new convert has just had his eyes opened. He's just now experiencing being in his right mind. And Jesus says, go home. Go home. That's the program. Apparently it worked. The Bible says when Jesus comes back to this area, great crowds came out to meet him. What is this man's story? 
I mean, what does he tell people when he gets back home? My life was one way. It was headed to destruction. I met this guy, Jesus. And it's kind of like being born a second time. I used to be one way, and now I'm different. And, and now I just have to tell you. I just have to share this story. I, I, I have this compulsion to tell other people what happened to me. I can't argue the science of it. I don't understand the philosophy of it. But I do understand that I used to be one way. And now I'm different. How do you explain it? When somebody says, what's it like to be a Christian? What's it like to be part of a church? I don't know if I can always explain it. But I've seen it happen when two or three or more gather. And, and when we share our brokenness, I see powerful things happen. When my community comes together and we just pass around this plate of bread and then we pass around another plate that has a little cup, I see powerful things happen. Jesus, how do I share my faith? How do I win people? How do I make converts? Jesus says, return home and tell people how much God has done for you. What can I talk to them about? Talk about knocking on doors. Talk about thirst. Talk about wind. That sounds a little, ba a little vague. Uh, shouldn't we argue about fossil records? Shouldn't we talk about false teaching or other religions? I mean, I guess you can, but that isn't what I see Jesus doing. The only instruction Jesus gives this man is go home. Go home to your people. Tell your story. Evangelize. Is my story enough? Apparently it is. What story do you think the world wants to hear? I mean, you tell me. Does the world outside want to hear all the things you've learned about fossils or how old the earth is? Or do you think they would rather hear about how you've seen firsthand the power of God working in your life? You have a story. Your story is relevant. Your story is dynamic. There's a story told by Marcus Borg, who was an American New Testament scholar, and he says that he actually got this story from the author Parker Palmer. It says, several years ago, I was told a story about a three-year-old girl. She was the firstborn and the only child in her family. But now her mother was pregnant again, and the little girl was very excited about having a new brother or sister. Within a few hours of the parents bringing the new baby boy home from the hospital, the girl made a request. She wanted to be alone with her new brother in his room with the door shut. And her insistence about being alone with the baby with the door shut made her parents a little uneasy, but then they remembered that they had installed an intercom system in the anticipation of the baby's arrival. So they realized they could let their daughter do this, and if they heard the slightest indication that anything strange was happening, they could be in the baby's room in an instant. So they let the little girl into the baby's room, shut the door, and then raced to the intercom, listening. They heard their daughter's footsteps moving across the room and imagined her standing over the crib. And then they heard her saying, to her three-day-old brother, tell me about God, because I have almost forgotten. I think it's interesting that this demon-possessed man, who's only been of sound mind for minutes, maybe hours, is trying to go with Jesus. He wants to go with him on the boat. And you'd think, yes, that's the best place for him, at the feet of his master, learning. And Jesus says, go home. 
tell others about God because they've almost forgotten. Return. Go back to your people. Back to your community, your neighborhood. Go back to your hairdresser, your boss, your job, your schools. Go home and tell how much God has done for you. Go home and tell somebody how the Lord blessed you this week. Go home and tell someone that Jesus Christ is Lord. Go home and tell somebody that you know a God who has your back. Go home and tell someone that Jesus cleans up the messes you make. Let me ask you something. When you leave church today and you go out for lunch, and as you go about your business this week, you go back to work, you go back to school, will you tell your friends, will you tell your coworkers, will you tell your family all that the Lord has done for you? Or are you gonna wait for a pastor to do it? Jesus tells the early church, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What does that mean? It means God has commissioned every Christian to be a missionary. It is up to all of us to go and tell. When Jesus rebukes the Pharisees, it wasn't because they evangelized. He was mad because they were poor teachers. They were poor examples. They were just making fake copies of themselves with all of their knowledge about the scriptures, with all of their perfect prayers, with all of their noble actions. Jesus still called them the sons of hell. But then to a brand new follower, a brand new believer, Jesus says, here's how you do it. You go and tell someone what God has done for you. In that same poll that I mentioned at the beginning of this, they were also asked, at this present time, do you think religion as a whole is increasing its influence or decreasing its influence? in the American life. You know what people said? 79% of people said Christianity is losing its influence. 79%. Go and tell somebody that Jesus loves them. Go and tell somebody that Jesus has a wonderful plan for their life. Go and tell somebody that Jesus Christ loves them so much that he died for them on the cross. Go and tell somebody that Jesus rose from the dead. Go and tell somebody that they can be saved, that they can have eternal life, that they can have their sins forgiven, and they can become a person just like you who has been born again. All they have to do is ask. All they have to do is seek. All they have to do is knock. All they have to do is thirst. Go home and tell someone the good news. If God has been good to you, tell somebody. If God has blessed you, tell somebody. If God has delivered you, tell somebody. If God has healed you, protected you, strengthened you, saved you, you ought to tell somebody. Let's pray. Lord, it is your mandate that we go and tell. It is your wish that every knee would bow. It is your wish that every tongue would confess. 
and your plan for the salvation of the world is and always has been your church. And if the world is losing its influence, if the world doesn't care about faith and Christ and the scriptures, it's, it's on us. It is on us. Happy are the feet that bring good news, your scriptures say. Help us to be happy people that remember all the wonder and joy and grace and love and care that's been shown to each one of us. We are bursting at the seams with blessing. May we never forget that each day our job is to tell the world. There's nothing else we should be sharing by email. There's no other news that we should be posting to Facebook. There's no other message. There's no other truth that we should care as much about other than the salvation of our neighbor, our brothers and our sisters. Each of us, may we learn to tell the story. May we share that story. May we love that story because it is a story about you and all the wonder you've done in our lives. Give us boldness. Give us braveness. Give us the words to speak and the opportunities to speak them. And may we continue to advance your kingdom. They will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Hey, thanks for being with us this morning. Thanks for watching. Don't forget, this is a YouTube video. It's located at youtube.com slash Walden Church. You can always clip and copy the URL, the address at the top. You can post it to your wall or share it with a friend who you think might benefit from listening this morning. I love you guys so much. We'll see each other soon. Bye.